Okay. So I want to talk about Ibn Arabi's cosmology, this five levels uh, scheme that we just saw. Ibn Arabi bases his cosmology on the renowned hadith in which God reveals the secret behind creation. Um, so Lisa, are you available just to read this tricky number 11? Okay, maybe she fell asleep. Why don't I just read it? I was a hidden treasure and I yearned to be known. Then I created creatures in order to be known by them. Now this is familiar to all Baha'is because Baha'u'llah quotes it in a slightly different version. For devout, devout Muslims such as Ibn Arabi, the whole process of creating the creatures in order to be known by them begins with God. However, as soon as the word God is mentioned, it can be understood from two points of view. We can consider God as he is in himself, in which case we must set aside the cosmos, which is everything other than God. That's the basic distinction that they make in all Muslim philosophies and mysticisms. <clears throat> Most Muslim thinkers and the Baha'i writings as well have come to the conclusion that God in himself, the essence of God, simply cannot be known. He is far beyond our grasp. This is the perspective of incomparability. Key Arabic term for that is tanzi. I'm going to be mentioning that quite a bit tonight and next week, or two weeks from now, which we will explain in a minute. If we mention the cosmos in the same breath with God, then we must take account of a host of relationships between God and the cosmos. These relationships are given verbal expression by the divine names. In this case, we are seeing God from the perspective of similarity. And the Arabic term for that is tashbi. Okay. So the word God has two basic meanings in Ibn Arabi's thought. First, it denotes the essence of God, which is the ultimate reality that is the fountainhead of all other realities. Okay, so let's see. How about Bill Kelly? It's a quick one, number 12. The, the essence cannot be known in positive terms. Human knowledge of the essence amounts to an acknowledgement that the essence is there and a recognition that we cannot know it. Mm -hmm. So in the second sense, the word God designates what Ibn Arabi calls the level. So there are two terms in Arabic for that, martaba and rutba. This is God's specific position in relation to any other reality found in the cosmos. And as I mentioned earlier, the word cosmos in Islam can be defined as everything other than God. Okay, Sherry, how about uh, number 13 for us? God's essence is identical with God's level, but God's essence is known only to God, while his level is the object of discussion whenever we envisage him in relation to others or in relation to himself. As soon as we mention God in the cosmos, we are talking about God in as much as he can be differentiated from the cosmos. We are situating him at a specific level, a level in which he may in fact stand. We have not exhausted the reality of God, but have simply mentioned an outlook on that reality. We can go on mentioning outlooks and standpoints ad infinitum, but we will never move closer to the essence since the infinite stands infinitely beyond the finite, always and forever. William Chittick. So 
even though we're describing Islam here, this is actually true of the Baha'i faith as well. There's nothing that would uh, alert us that something is incorrect about this. It's not our typical language, but the ideas of the essence of God and the God who is who has names and attributes and actions, etc., is the same. So when we discuss God's level, we do so in terms of attributes and attributions. In the Quran, these are known as the divine names. They are rela the relations that can be visualized between God and the cosmos. The divine names refer to God's level or position vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos and everything within it, not to his essence as such. So Ibn Arabi uses three basic terms more or less interchangeably to refer to the divine names. First, names, attributes, and relations, sometimes relationships. So some distinction can be made based on their parts of speech, grammatically speaking. Uh, my goodness, how about Bob LeBlanc, number 14? Okay. A grammatical distinction can be drawn among these terms because name refers technically to adjectives by which God can be addressed, such as alive, knowing, powerful, compassionate, and forgiver. Both attributes and relations refer to the abstract nouns that these names specify, life, knowledge, power, compassion, and forgiveness. Thus, God has the name alive and the attribute of life. Ibn Arabi has in view the relations that most of the names establish between God and the cosmos. Oh, wait, let me read that again. Thus, God has the name alive and the attribute of life. Ibn Arabi has in view the relations that most of the names establish between God and the cosmos. Thus, God is knowing, which is to say he knows the objects of his knowledge, whether these are himself or the cosmos and its contents. Hence, the relation of knowledge is established between him and what he knows. He is creator, so the attribute or relation of creativity is established between him and his creation. William Chittick. Hmm. Good, thank you. So the attributes distinguish the two sides of the relationship God has with everything other than himself. The names are applicable to both sides, but do not mean the same thing in both cases. So for instance, Ibn Arabi uses the formula of the first half of the Shahada, there is no God but God, to highlight the two senses of a single attribute. So for example, we can apply the term real with a capital R to both God and created things. If we rely on the Shahada, we recognize that there is none real, but the real. That which is truly real is God, while the, the creatures at best bor possess a borrowed reality. So that's why there's a distinction in the, in the books that I'm reading between the capital R for God and the small R for everything else. Thus a creature is real from one point of view, but unreal from another point of view. The attribute of unreality pertains only to the creatures, not to God. So borrowing a term from Muslim philosophy, Ibn Arabi primarily refers to the essence of God as wujud, W-U-J-U-D. This Arabic word has several meanings. It has typically been translated into English as being or existence, which is the usual philosophical meaning. Chedic, who I have a lot of respect for, prefers to employ the primary sense of the word, translating it as finding or being found. The word is used in a wide range of contexts. On the highest level, wujud is the absolute and non-delimited reality of God, the necessary being that cannot 
not exist. In this sense, Wujud des designates the essence of God or the real, the only reality that is real in every respect. Uh, Joey, are you there? I'm wondering if you could read 15 for us. Don't worry about the Arabic terms in brackets. On lower levels, wujud is the underlying substance of everything other than God, which is how Ibn Arabi and others define the cosmos or universe. Hence, in a secondary meaning, the term wujud is used as shorthand to refer to the whole cosmos, to everything that exists. It can only be employed to refer to the existence of each and everything that is found in the universe. William Chittick. I think that was actually, it can also be employed. Oh, sorry. Uh, not only. Yeah. Okay. So in Ibn Arabi's cosmology, everything other than God borrows wujud from God as it enters into existence. It's a little loan that you get. Their degree of reality is thus less real than God's. When you die, your allotted portion of wujud is returned to God. It possesses only a relative degree of reality when compared with the essence of God. Now let's see where we are. Uh, Danielle, could you read the 16 for us? Again, without, don't worry about the things in brackets. If on the one hand, the universe exists through God's wujud. On the other hand, the things, she, or entities, ain, that are found in the universe possess their own specific properties. These things are other than God. And as we have seen, God is wujud. It follows that in themselves, without God, the things do not exist and cannot be found. The Sheikh maintains that everything we perceive in the cosmos is non-existent in itself, but existent in some sense through the real wujud. William Chittick. Thank you. Hmm. So it's because of that divine spark that is in us that we're here. If that wasn't available to us, we wouldn't have ever been born. Hmm. In Ibn Arabi's cosmology, every single thing that attains physical existence, which previously existed in a potential form in the mind of God, uh, he calls them fixed entities or archetypes. That's that Ayn Thabita I was talking about earlier. Um, these single things become visible to themselves and others only after God says, be, and it is. Now that's in the Quran and it's in Baha'u'llah's writings. Each thing borrows its wujud, its being from God for its limited period of existence and then must return its quota back to the source when its time has ended. These fixed entities may seem rather innocuous, but they have hidden depth waiting to be explored. So here's a summary from the work of a prominent Iranian scholar. He's not Iranian, but he studies Islam, Kevin Brown. Well, actually, I, I, he's, he's referring to an Iranian scholar. I beg your pardon, I wrote it. Ah, I'm getting tired, sorry. <clears throat> I need somebody to read number 17. How about Jack? Save sure. me here, Jack. Yeah, Kevin Brown is a Baha'i too, as far as yeah. I know. Yeah. 
Yes, he is. Okay, Professor Jafar Sajadi gives the following definition of fixed archetypes. Ayan Thabita, which I believe means stamped from the beginning, anyway. Well, it may not mean that, but that's the idea. According to the wayfarers, the Sufis, these are intelligible forms in the world of God. And in the terminology of the philosophers, they are the essences of things. The archetypes are the forms of the divine names and souls are the manifest, oh, okay. The archetypes are the forms of the divine names and souls are the manifestations of the archetypes. Kevin Brown, dialogue regarding platonic forms. Uh, I just, I happened to notice the chat while that was going on. Let me just uh, stop for a second here. Sylvie's got an interesting question. What does Chittick mean by the essence can't be known in positive terms? Um, Mujan Moman has an interesting way of phrasing it. He says that as when you're, you're talking about the essence of God, all you can do is say he. As soon as you try and say anything beyond that, you're blaspheming. So you can't say a thing about the essence of God. Even the manifestations of God don't know about the essence of God. Well, they know of its existence, but they don't know anything about it. So we can't really say anything negative or positive about it. You see what I'm saying? You're nodding your head. That's a good sign. Well, actually, Mark, I think this is a reference to negative theology. Probably. Which Abdul Baha talks about in some answered questions, because what it, what it means when you can't say anything positively about God, you can only describe him in negative terms. So I'll give you an example. If you say that God is all powerful, you're using a positive description of God, but it's taken from human conditions because our only experience of power <clears throat> has to do with humans. Okay, so, so what the mistake of that positive affirmation is that you're comparing God to something else. And you can't do that. So negative theology says, and it also runs in Judaism and Islam, I believe, that you, you say, and again, Abdul Baha speaks about this in some answered questions. So I'm not making this up. <laughs> so to be more accurate, you say God is not without power. Hmm. See, that's a negative definition, Sylvie, rather than a positive definition, right? So that's, I think that's sort of the idea there. There's negative theology involved in that. And so the, the, Jew, the Jews, I think, came up with that originally, that you should only describe God in negative terms. Because if you describe him in positive terms, you're not accurately describing him because you're comparing him to human things. Fascinating. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let me go back to sharing. But Mark, can I just ask, I mean, we slipped into something there by saying the reality doesn't exist except in the mind of God until the mind, I mean, you're saying the mind, that God has a mind and that the reality comes from that. So we've slipped into describing it and in a knowable form. Yeah. 
that's a, that's that's humans for you. <laughs> we talk a good line, but boy, it's easy to jump off. And we're really limited when we talk about the essence of God, which is why we should never really talk about the essence of God. <laughs> And that's, it's interesting that this is a feature of the Baha'i faith. Um, both the Bab and Baha'u'llah made a very big deal about this distinction. There are pages and pages and pages, repeated and repeated, that we shouldn't talk about the essence of God. We have no idea. Just shut up about it. And, you know, the idea that a Sufi could become one with the essence of God is ludicrous. And I think that's why they, they made such a big deal about it. So if we're going to talk about God, then we have to talk about the names and attributes, which means we have to talk about the manifestations of God. Because those are synonymous, as we'll see. Okay, I'm off my high horse. So I'm going to keep going here. If we set aside the wujud of things for a moment, we can ask about the things in themselves. What is an entity, a rock, a tree, a human being, a sun, a world, in itself without reference to wujud? According to Ibn Arabi, its reality or essence remains the same whether it's found in the cosmos or not. The way he conceives it, each thing has two states or situations. When it is found in the phenomenal world, the physical world, it displays a certain borrowed existence, which it gives back to God when it disappears, as when a person dies or a stone turns to dust. Well, that's uh, number 18, and maybe uh, Peter could read that for us. It did not possess existence in the first place, so it does not cease to exist in the second place. It stays in its original state of fixity or immutability in non-existence. William Chittick. Hmm. What does it mean to say that a non-existent entity is fixed? What are the fixed entities? In Islam, God is not only infinite wujud, he is also infinite in eternal knowledge. As the Quran says, God encompasses all things in knowledge. It makes no difference whether the things he knows are found in the cosmos or not. Um, how about Zilda? Number 19. God knows all things forever, even before he creates them. And he knows them in all the characteristics that they will display during their sojourn in the universe. His knowledge of the things corresponds precisely to the non-existent things in themselves. The thing in itself is called the reality or immutable entity of the thing. And these realities or immutable entities remain for, forever fixed in God's knowledge. Their Plurality does not bring about plurality in wajud any more than the plurality of our ideas causes our minds to have many parts. Thank you. So if the existent entities are non-existent in their own essences, how is it that we can see them in the cosmos and refer to them as existent? Getting complicated. One of Ibn Arabi's responses to this question is that what we see is not the cosmos, but wujud itself. The real, since nothing else has existence to allow it to be seen. However, we see the real only in as much as it is manifest, not in as much as it is non-manifest. Here the Sheikh typically cites the Quranic verse, he is the first and the last, the manifest and the non-manifest. That's from Quran 057. 
Ibn Arabi explains that wujud becomes manifest because God as manifest displays himself in a locus of manifestation, a place of manifestation, which is the cosmos itself. God cannot display himself as the non-manifest because by definition, God as non-manifest is inaccessible and unknowable. So now we've got the idea that what you're seeing in the cosmos is the manifest side of God or the face of God. Everything we see. When we, are think, we think we are perceiving things or entities around us, we are not perceiving the entities themselves, but rather wujud permeated by the properties or effects of the entities, while the entities remain immutably non-existent. That's a hard one to swallow. Just go with it. It's not critical that you memorize what I'm talking about here. But the idea about the locus of manifestation being the cosmos is very important. Mark, just yeah. to... Go ahead. One, one point, Abdu'l-Baha talks about, let's say, a hierarchy of existence. Yeah. That uh, to someone of a, a higher existence, someone of a, of a lower existence doesn't exist. Yes. And could that shed some light on this? It definitely fits. Yeah. Like to, uh, the, to a plant, the rock doesn't exist. Um, now that's why human beings can't understand manifestations of God fully. Yes. And uh, for uh, somebody who is, as Abdul Baha <clears throat> was enkindled by the spirit, somebody who is spiritually dead doesn't exist or is dead. And that spiritually dead person has no idea what's really different about that other person. Yeah. I, I had came up with this idea of the mathematician's dog. You know, if you imagine a dog and the mathematician here, he's a professor of mathematics, and he's covering his, his whiteboard with all kinds of formulas and Greek symbols and everything like this, and the dog can't understand what he's doing. <laughs> that uh, to the mind of the dog, uh, this is total, total gibberish. And even if he did understand it, he have, it would have no means of communicating it to other dogs. But uh, since this mathematician earns his livelihood through his mathematics, the, the essence of life for the dog, his shelter and his food and everything comes from that mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's a good, a good analysis or uh, analogy. But it's just an, it's just an idea. Yeah. I see Carol has her hand up. Uh, what would you like to say, Carol? <clears throat> Only that uh, it, it, there's something that is binding and it's the attributes. And so when uh, Abdu'l-Baha says servitude of all creation and he, was, he named himself servant of God, then you know, his attributes shine through not only his name, but his whole being, his whole essence, right? Yep. And then when you talk about God and his attributes through his manifestations, through his Baha'u'llah, through his Kisra, it's seen even in ancient times that he is light and why he called Baha'is the people of light. And when he manifested himself to Moses, it was through a burning bush. He was, he was fire. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, a, there's, there's a kindredship in that attributes bind us to him as he binds himself to us through his light, through his, his, his ever present wanting to have his kindredship, his, 
close to us through the writings, through the prayers. He doesn't want us to be afar from him. He wants us to be happy, just like Abdul Baha, be happy, be close to God. So there's a kindredship in 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 attributes. Yep. You're quite right. And that that's from Ibn Arabi's point of view, that's all bound up with the the makeup of wujud itself. It has all the names and attributes in it. So that's why there is uh, so much similarity between us. So, you know, it, I have not yet come across an explanation by Ibn Arabi nor any other Muslim mystic of the differences inherent within non-existent entities, which become obvious only when they are given the gift of existence by God. How is it that those entities are different? So as Abdul Baha explains, two children of the same parents living in the same circumstances for years will still display differing characters. And this is normally attributed to the fact that God never repeats himself. But there's no real explanation as to why those fixed entities, or whatever name you give them, in the mind of God, are different from each other. Billions of them. Anyway, that's just a side note. So let's talk about the names of God a little bit more. Let me just stop sharing this. Okay. Um, what can we know about wujud as it is in itself? At the outset, it seems nothing at all, other than that it is indefinable and inaccessible. We can only know wujud to the extent that it is on loan to us for a specific period of time. Despite its inaccessibility, we know something about it because we have varying degrees of knowledge of ourselves and the cosmos around us. And this knowledge provides intimations from the re of the reality from which all things spring forth. So if the world, the cosmos, is the place where the, the manifest face of God is visible to all of us, we can learn things from it and from each other if we've been paying attention. Ibn Arabi goes searching for wujud self-revelations in the Quran and in the Hadith. It is his contention that wujud reveals itself to human beings linguistically through divine revelation in order to inform us of its nature. That's why God reveals himself to us that way. He reveals himself to us in a different kind of way in the cosmos itself, but that's not enough for most people. In order for them to understand more about how the system works, God has to explain it through his revelations. The entire message of the Quran can be summarized through the names of God, traditionally said to number 99. Ibn Arabi believes that each name of God mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith tells us something about the reality of wujud, even if wujud's ultimate reality can never be known. That's why he's always looking for the divine roots or divine supports of all phenomenon in the universe via Islamic scripture. The qualities of wujud are expressed linguistically through the Quranic verses, which are called signs, ayat. In fact, this is the only one of three ways to detect these qualities. So, wujud's qualities are also expressed ontologically through the universe. Ontological means through being. And epistemologically through our own self-knowledge. The Sheikh frequently quotes the following Quranic verse, which recommends that people gaze upon the cosmos and within themselves in order to perceive the signs of God's reality. Okay, let's bring that up. 
Okay, another short one. Let's see. Uh, hang me. How about you? Number 20. We shall show them our signs upon the horizons and within themselves till it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Hmm. Well, the horizons is the macrocosm, if you like, and within themselves means the microcosm. They're closely related, interestingly enough. We could go off on a tangent and talk about that, but take, it, take my word for it. They're very closely related in Islam. In the Muslim worldview, there are thus three books from which to learn about wujud. Revelation, the macrocosm, and the microcosm. Ideally, we're paying attention to all three. So in this class, we must restrict our gaze to the evidence of wujud's qualities provided by the Quran. I haven't got time to do the rest. The divine names are a tremendously fertile source of insights for Muslim thinkers of all stripes. So the second handout, which I'll bring up right now, I guess, do that right now. Oops. Sorry, I had to close this, open this, and then go to this. This is a chart that I've created based on Julio Savi towards the summit of reality. Um, I better shrink this a bit so you can see it all. There. Okay, so this contains the, the 99 names in the first <clears throat> column on the left. It runs to four pages. Uh, now these, this is found in uh, Al Rizali's book on the divine names. He died in 1111. <clears throat> so it includes the Arabic name right here in this column here. And then Burrell and Daher were the translators of Al Rizali. So this is his or their translation of his understanding of these words. And then there's some different translations of the Quran here. Primarily, the are standard. There are two that are referred to a lot, uh, Rodwell's version and Arbery's. And then finally, this is the most useful, I think, for us in the long term, is the Baha'i Writings version of those names and where they're found. So you might want to print this and keep it. I think it's a very useful document. As you can see, it goes. Now, there are some cases where there doesn't appear to be uh, the promoter, for instance, in the Baha'i faith, or the postponer, or the ruler. But anyway, that's something that's a takeaway from you, a gift from me to you. <laughs> Durham has his hand raised. Okay, Durham, take it away. Just a comment that there is a hadith says that when Qa'im appears, he will revere the hundredth name of God. The hundredth one. The hundredth one. Yes. Which is Baha. Yeah. And it's interesting, some more than hundred or two hundred years ago, there was a sheikh in Persia who also brought the name Baha at that time. Very interesting. But it was ignored, you know, until <laughs> Bob came in and brought this thing here. It's very <laughs> Very interesting. <clears throat> Thank you for the gift. You're welcome. <laughs> Mark, I think it was a genius of Shoghi Effendi to translate that. Uh, I forget which name it is. It's not on the screen now going up higher as the, uh, the help in peril. What a terrific translation. Mm -hmm. Well, there it is. El, el, el Mohai. Mohaimin. So Arbery's got it as the all preserving, <clears throat> and Shoghi Effendi gave a, a slightly different twist. He called it the help in peril, which is a fantastic translation, really. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Mark? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, can I share a discovery I made about these names? Yeah, please. Y you know, you could, you could create an instant prayer. Like, uh, if I, I'll go through the second to the seventh name, and you could say, Thou art the merciful, may I too be merciful. Thou art the compassionate, may I too show compassion. Thou art the king, may I develop a degree of royalty. Thou art the holy, may I too become holy. Thou art peace, may I too become peace. In other words, every one of the names is, uh, that's why they have prayer beads. And you, you're praying to have uh, a higher degree of these qualities. Yes. So you're distinguishing between the infinite version and the finite version, which you we have a, a, a finite version that can be developed. So praying is spiritual work. And Sufism involves, you know, prayer beads. So does the Baha'i faith. But it, it just, in other words, signs to, to relate it to that is amazing. Uh, every one of these are possibilities or spiritual potentials for us to develop. And also a little glimpse of the infinite because the, God has these qualities to a degree that's infinite and that we can't understand. So the names are just wonderful uh, spiritual exercises and they were made such, you know, by, by the Sufis, mm -hmm. all the figures that we're studying. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so you could, like yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Well, how many prayers could you make using these 99 names? See, I just, I gave you one just now with five or six verses. You, you could keep on going with any set of these, yep. any yep. set, short or long. Yep. <laughs> In case you wonder what to pray about and, and don't have your prayer book with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, for that matter, you could take any name and meditate on it. Exactly. And one of the, the typical things that uh, the Sufis do is to repeat the name over and over and over and over and over again, yeah, thousands mm -hmm. of times per day. Yeah, that's the zik. To internalize it. Remembrance of yeah. God's names. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I should bring back up the readings. All right, we're going to go on here. <clears throat> we're coming near to the end, folks. I know everybody's probably a little bit buzzed with all the information. So as others before him have done, Ibn Arabi divides the names and attributes into two groups, according to whether they're incomparable or similar. OK, number 21, we need to go to maybe Sylvie who could read this one for us. Sure. These two groups of names are often called the names of beauty and majesty, or gentleness and subjugation, or mercy and wrath. Sometimes Ibn al-Arabi refers to them as the two hands with which God created Adam. William Chittick, The Self-Disclosure of God. Mm -hmm. That's a nice image, the two hands of God. As in, in the Quran, uh, Adam is created by God picking up some dirt and using both hands to shape this thing and then blows his spirit into him. Okay. <clears throat> Ibn Arabi cites the numerous Quranic verses describing God as non-manifest on the one hand and God as manifest on the other hand in order to explain his idea that the cosmos is God's self-disclosure. Okay, let's see who's here. Um, how about David Oak, number 22? David had to leave, Mark. Oh, okay. He, he and Master, he left at nine. Okay. Um, alrighty, how about Linda O'Neill? Okay, sorry, what, so what number are we on, 22? Uh, 22, yes, please. Yes. In respect of the first name, he is the incomparable essence. 
but in respect of the second name, he displays himself to the universe through the traces and properties of his names. The universe is nothing other than his display, his self-disclosure, or his locus of manifestation. Hence, in the final analysis, the cosmos is God as manifest, while everything other than the cosmos is God as non-manifest. William Chittick. Mm -hmm. So whenever human beings focus on the lack of comparison between God and everything other than God, which means on God's transcendence and unknowability, we run headlong into the impenetrable wall of our own limitations. No existent thing can ever stand on a par with wujud. This inescapable fact led Muslims to describe God in terms of incomparability. That's that term tanzi I was mentioning earlier. Tanzi literally means to declare or to affirm that something is far away or free from something else. Okay, we're almost done. Number 23, let's see. Is Marie Palmer there, please? Yes, I am. Great. I'm just uh, moving up to... Um, since I take this on my phone, I'm taking, I'm moving up to the, oh. uh, to the, the larger screen. Okay. Reading 23. Yes, please. It is to assert that God is pure and free of all the defects and imperfections of the creatures. In the perspective of Tanzi, God is so holy and pure that he cannot be compared to any created thing, including concepts, since all our ideas are created. The Quranic verse that expresses Tanzi most clearly is nothing is like him. William Chittick and Sashiko Murata, The Vision of Islam. Thank you. <clears throat> so the transcendence of God was hardly a new idea in Ibn Arabi's time. It had been a, tr a foundational conception among Muslims from the earliest days of the religion. And let's see who's going to have the chance. How about Jennifer to read the last one? The position of incomparability was affirmed by the theologians long before Ibn Arabi, and he accepts it as true. However, he points out that this description of the divine reality does not provide a full picture of Wujud because it does not account satisfactorily for the signs of God that appear in the cosmos and in scripture. Hmm. So <clears throat> that's where I'm gonna leave it tonight. Uh, next time, I wanna explore this distinction. There's a lot more to be gained from talking about those two halves of the equation, the incomparable and the similar. And then we'll talk about the self-manifestations of God, the Tajaliyat. So I presume everybody's taken a look at the uh, full course outline that I finally provided you. That gives you an idea of where we're going from here. The next class will be our last one on Islam. And then we're going to just immerse ourselves in the Baha'i faith for the next four. So the only other thing I need to mention is that we are not having a class next week. So I'll mention that again by email, that our next time to meet is on December the 2nd. And then we'll meet right through that month. So uh, now it's time. We have 12 minutes left if you want to go all the way to 930, uh, or we can cut right now, depending on whether there are questions. Mark Dur Durham has his hand up. Ah, okay, good. I have a few uh, comments and question. I think that Ibn Arabi thinks that God has prototype of human being. That's why he knows about them before they exist. So he's, he has this world and he has his prototype that he works with, you know, before they create. So I'm just 
it just gave me this idea when he speaks about existing, non-existing, you know, by God. It's just an idea. That was one thing. Interesting. Another thing, you know, green, we spoke about khidr, or we say khizra in English. <laughs> you know that the descendant of <laughs> Muhammad, they all wear green turban. And that's interesting related to al khidr you know, the green thing. Yep. And uh, the other point I wanted, uh, you may know that in the hidden words, the word wujud is translated by the guardian as being, or son of being. So that's another thing I thought to just mention it because it's there. Good, good. Oh, okay. and, and, and the other thing is in Quran, you know, David left, but I thought to mention that in the writing of Baha'u'llah, he quotes a lot, as you know, from Quran. There's lots, lots in the Bible from Quran. And also interesting, there's one chapter which is called The Light, Surat Nur. In it, it's very interesting how he describes God, really, in this chapter. If you read it and you see how he, it's described. But after description, he mentions the need to build houses where you recite the words of God in the morning and in the evening. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we know Baha'u'llah advised us that we have to do this, actually. If you don't do it, you're not obedient to the <laughs> law of God. But I mean, I found this recently in this chapter that they build houses to recite the the Holy Scripture in the morning and in the evening. Thank oh. you. Oh, the, the question. The question is, I'm interested to know you have more wise women on your sessions more than men. I don't know why. I mean, there are very few men here, you know? Is that interesting? We have to think about that. Hmm. Okay, ladies. No, it's only interesting to men because the women understand it already. <laughs> interesting. We see the same thing in the big ideas presentation. There's more women than men. But isn't that an interesting question? We have to really ask ourselves why. And in Ruhi, all of these things. Yeah. Hmm. I just worked it out. It was it's seventy-five percent women. Good for you, Bob. Wow. Hmm. Anybody got any thoughts as to the reason for this? Mary has one. Yes, you gotta unmute yourself, Mary. We can't hear you, Mary. Mary is still muted. There she is. Okay. There she goes. No, the gentlemen, they think they know everything. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, that's the reason. They believe. Oh, okay. They believe mentally. <laughs> but didn't Abdul Baha say that women were more naturally drawn to spiritual things or something like that? You made a comment something along that line, yeah. <clears throat> they're, they're more intrinsically religious, I think, in some ways. Carolyn, what's your view of it? Well, I've been thinking about uh, Kadir being the archetype and uh, a person too, that he's theophanic person. And, but he, they explain in your nice characteristics of Kadir's world that, um, the mystic even comes to perceive his own theophany. And to me, that means that, and, and, and that, that corresponds to his inner heaven. And to me, that is very um, significant because women giving birth to, giving birth, giving life to other 
human beings. It's it's like it's part of a heaven. It's a creation, and it means that um, we also should have our own name by uh, given by God. It's in this creative uh, process. So <laughs> I sort of see it all tied together, um, hmm. uh, bound up with a theophanic person, even though we're not archetypes. <laughs> hmm. Okay, Belinda, what are you thinking? Well, in the older churches, it was often the pattern that the uh, men ran the church, but the women did all the work. Yeah. Well, it's not true um, in this case. When women started in our <laughs> century going out to work. <laughs> I did all the work. Yes, I'm getting to that. <laughs> and, 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 um, in the 20th century, when women started going out to work and they weren't, didn't have much time to give to the church anymore, a lot of the churches started to fade. <laughs> because they'd lost their free labor. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Now, the other thing I was going to say is um, it, it, this time in history is possibly the first time when women have, many of us now have the freedom to express ourselves openly this way. Yeah. Uh, to an extent that not before. You see, think about Sufism, it's largely men. Uh, there's a couple of women here and there, but uh, the practitioners appear and the Sufi writers and so forth appear to be men. Now, I know there were women disciples, but you don't hear about them. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what that's exactly all about. But uh, mm -hmm. now I want to go on to say something here. Um, Baha'u'llah talks and Abdul Baha talks about the two wings. Um, yes, this group and many others, we see more women, but we also see a few men. And it's very good that they're there because some of these men actually know something and are willing to share it. You're talking about Durham, I think. I, I am, yes. I was thinking of Durham in particular, but I was actually thinking of, of all the men who are present. They all have knowledge that they're willing to share. And um, the, uh, at this point in time, it helps to bring the two wings into better balance. That's a nice idea. I like that. A big mess today. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to. I was just going to add to that. And say that for for me, um, well, I'll give you one example. Many many years ago, in the 1980s, I took a um, a uh, a uh, a literature course at Carleton University, and um, it was at night, and. What I found was all of the students were women, except for me and another man. There were just two of us. And I was fascinated by that. And I remember talking to uh, several of them, or many of them, asking about themselves. And I found out that uh, they were um, either single mothers, uh, you know, uh, or maybe not, but they were, they were all, they all wanted to gain knowledge. They all, they had a tremendous drive. And I was so taken with this. I thought it was absolutely marvelous. And I think that's the same today. Um, and also, you know, uh, women, I think, I don't know if I got the right for it, closer to the ground of being. And, you know, um, I think that women have a greater sense of, of the human heart and of relationship than men do. And I think this is extremely important uh, as to why you see more women than men on the whole. Well, that's what I wanted to say. Oh, okay. I see Bill's got his hand up. So, um, at, the risk of, <laughs> at the risk of seeming sexist, um, uh, it occurred to me that, that uh, women are 
much more involved in both life and death uh, than men are. That that every, uh, every uh, premenstrual woman uh, from the time of reaching age yeah. experiences a small death every month with the, uh, the the disposal of an egg, and that the cycles that women have are in tune with the cycles of life and that, uh, you know, obviously life comes through women. So I think women are just by their, by their nature, uh, much more tuned in to uh, both life and death and the reality of those things because they're, they are much more uh, a participant in those in our reality and that uh, it would be only natural that women would be both um, competent and interested in uh, what is, you know, in the aspects of life and the aspects of death, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about um, uh, what happens beyond life. Uh, so I think that it's a natural thing. I remember from all, all the time that when I was a kid going to churches, anything spiritual, there was always more women. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's just a, it's the, the nature of the sexes. And I think um, if you don't have the capacity to go to those same places, it just means that they're less likely to do so because of the demands of their environments and, and the experience uh, that they don't have. <clears throat> Okay, we're almost out of time. Mark, Jack oh. has his hand up, I think. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jack. And then we might have to end it then. Well, I, I think women are more intrinsically religious than men because of the tenderness of their hearts. And they're more grounded as, I mean, I echo all of these comments. They're, they help to ground the men, I think. And, and relationship is their thing, generally speaking. But I think we should be all very grateful to Baha'u'llah for abolishing monasticism. Like Belinda said, you know, the Sufis were largely men. The Sufi lodges were mainly men. That's true. There were a few outstanding women Sufis like uh, Al Rabia Al Adwida or whatever, you know, her name was. But yeah, that was her name. A marvelous Sufi mystic and poet. And um, so I'm very grateful to Baha'u'llah for abolishing that, that monastic way of life because it, it allows both sexes to participate more fully in the discourse of religion. And of course, abolishing cler clergy was another genius thing that Baha'u'llah did. It wasn't abolished. Because then it allows both sexes to participate fully in the uh, in religious discourse. Okay, we, uh, I think should probably close there, if you don't mind. I, I feel kind of worn out. I don't know how you're feeling. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having two weeks before our next session, actually. <laughs> we'll miss so, you. Good night, guys. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Thank Lovely you. Good night. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. Good night, all. Thank Good you. Nice to see everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. everybody. Good night. Lovely to see you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. People don't stick around very much, do they? When you <laughs> They're ready to roll. <laughs> ready to go. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Danielle. Hi, Wayne. Good night, Suzanne. Good night, Danielle. Harold, we quit. Good night, Harold. <laughs> he must have turned off his sound. He's going to wonder where everybody went. <laughs> He's looking for something. Thank you so much. I okay. really nice to see you, Take Danielle. Care of Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, I'm going to log off here. <laughs>